Um, he, he has been uh, working for, at Bing for 11 years, but Bing exists for 10 years, so it was even before it was even launched. And he will speak also about fact-checking, but from a different perspective, from the uh, understanding why, how users access misinformation. Perfect. So I, I'm going to start off with, kind of like my colleague Dan, I'm not going to talk about everything Bing is doing in this space or everything that's, that's happening uh, with online misinformation right? That, that we're working on or across Microsoft. I'm really going to focus today on some of what we've seen in search, right? specifically a little bit about some, what are some of the query patterns that we've seen that have led people to known misinformation, and what does that look like from a search engine perspective and some of the unique challenges. One of the first things I really want to touch on is that you know, different platforms really play different roles in kind of an online modern information society. And it's really important that when we think about this that, you know, one size fits all solutions don't necessarily work. That doesn't mean there aren't commonalities, that doesn't mean there aren't data we can't share, because there's a lot we can do. But there are definitely differences, you know, especially when we look at different engagement models. In a social media platform, users really get a feed of information without really coming in with a specific question. Very different than search. Right? What we see in search is users are coming in, they're asking a specific question, and we're trying to get them the best information that we can that helps them with that question. You know, one of the things that we, you know, as I talk about, I want to give a little context to some of the data that I'm going to share first, and specifically, what did we study and what did we look at? So we looked at, really, a set of existing sites that were known to have credibility issues, right? There are multiple lists out there. I'm not going to give everyone that's there, but, but Wikipedia has a list of um, fake news sites that were out around the time of the election and on. Uh, Snopes has a list of misinformation sites. Uh, I also brought hate into this. I, I know today we're really talking about misinformation, but when I've studied this, I often look at misinformation and hate together uh, because in many cases I see a conflation. So I did use some of the Southern Poverty Law Center's um, data as well. I tried to avoid labeling these sites or, or having Microsoft really come in and say what was misinformation, what was not for the purpose of this study. I, I focused on using external lists so that when we look at this from a more research lens, it, it's something that could be understood. The, the first thing I'll say is that really when we look at the traffic when people went from search and went off to some of these misinformation sites, an overwhelming majority of the traffic was navigational. Right? Depending upon when I've run this and what I've looked at, it, it could be well over 75% was navigational. And, and when I talk about navigational, what I mean is the user very clearly put the name of the site into the query in some way or other. Or they have used a popular author. Right? And it's an author that's, that's very well known with misinformation sites. You know, they've asked, what, what does that author say on this topic? Or um, what does this site say on that topic? And that, that's where, when we think about where traffic and how people are getting via search to some of these disreputable sites, how they're getting there. The other pattern that we see are really uh, data voids, or what we call data voids. And I will say I'm going to spend most of my time on this. This is part of a published paper that is published via uh, Data and Society, which Dana Boyd and I co-authored. Um, really, we see people querying for these things in what I sometimes will call unnatural ways. Right? They've, they've come with a very specific query for a specific topic. And these are topics where there are not always uh, great, credible, or reputable things that address these queries. 
Um, you, you can see some of the examples on the screen. But I will say that these are very temporal. If I were to go run this analysis today, I will get another set of queries. Uh, the queries that I'm showing here are the queries that were leading to these sites when I ran the, the data. But I've run this three, four times, and, and I can tell you the queries are volatile. In particular, we've seen some queries really that, you know, after there's an extremist incident, right? Name of extremist incident is a false flag, right? Where people are very much trying to navigate or have come across a rumor somewhere that they want to learn more about. Obviously, then, when we think about what's available in more credible media, credible media doesn't talk about extremist or terrorist attacks as being a false flag. And users very quickly fall into these gaps. Right? Um, we've also seen it with school shootings in the US, where there's been introductions of terms like crisis actor. Um, You know, I, the other thing I'll touch on here is that we don't really know the motivations of users issuing these queries. Right? We see these kind of unnatural queries. We don't know where they came across this or where the ideas to run these queries have come to them. Um, the other pattern I'll say is that we've seen things that look almost verbatim uh, of the headlines that, that we've seen on fake news sites where, you know, we'll look at where did the user go uh, the headline of that fake news misinformation article is almost verbatim of what the user typed in the search. And we can hypothesize that means they saw it somewhere. Did they hear it on a radio? Did, did they see it on a feed somewhere and want to know more about it later? We don't know. The next thing I'll touch on are what are some of the things that we're doing to think about combating this? And obviously, you know, we don't have solutions for all the problems that these data void queries present because they present a whole host of problems uh, where users are asking for something that there's not a lot of credible information. Um, sometimes users can ask for things that there's not a lot of credible information and it's not necessarily misinformation, it's just not popular or a fringe topic, right? Sometimes these queries look very much like, um, how do I repair some obscure part in a car? Right? It's extremely rare. There's not a lot of huge reputable sites that have information about how to fix obscure parts in cars. Right? So differentiating them is super difficult. But one of the things that we look at is how do we really, when users come to search sometimes with leading questions, right? they'll ask things like, is fill in the blank good for you? Is fill in the blank bad for you? And we want to help them navigate these multiple perspectives when we can and, and when it makes sense to do so by actually highlighting, showing a little bit from both sides and, and letting them help navigate through that space. The other thing we really try to do is with a featured news segment that we add in the search that, that really puts in the spotlight um, some of the major news. It helps them navigate that news concept at a better perspective, right? I'll note I took this screenshot a couple days ago, so it might not reflect the latest politics, right? But really the goal is to show what, what's a timeline? You know, what's happened in that story? What are some of the opinions in the story, right? And, and this is not necessarily bringing in just factual information, but very good, high-quality editorial and opinions that can help people navigate and understand these topics at a broader level. And I, I will note, this is also one of the interventions and one of the things we do is claim review and fact check, which, which Dan covered in, in a lot of detail, so I'm not going to spend time really on fact check, but it is very much a part of what we look at in this space, amongst other things. Um, finally, there's, there's a couple of things I do want to touch on that are across Microsoft because I think they're important to talk about as well. Right? One of them is really Microsoft News, which is not part of the search product, but a separate news product. And really, when we think about that, you know, Microsoft News, is, its goal is to show uh, 
a broader perspective that's very focused on news and very focused on current events. Right? And, and they partner with news organizations to help make sure that there are adequate revenue sharing models, that they're delivering high quality news, but bringing in diverse perspectives as well. Right? And there is obviously a combination there when we look at that news product of how human and AI combine to make sure that there's editorial oversight to some of the algorithms in that news focused product. The last thing I'll mention is some of the broader work we've done around defending democracy that really focuses not really on what's available just to consumers through Microsoft, but really to some of our, our uh, customers and partners, right, that are focused really on how do we think about election integrity? How do we think about campaign security, making sure campaigns aren't hacked and that there's secure and integrity around campaigns? And also, obviously, disinformation defense is part of this. How do we think about things like deep fakes? Any question for Microsoft? Ferenc? Hi. Uh, this, thanks for the talk. This is Franz from Twitter. Um, when you showed this like diverse perspectives things with the multiple mm -hmm. opinions, um, what are the ways you think about evaluating how that changes you, user behavior when you do show them the different options? Like, do you? What would be a metric you would track over time that would show you that you've succeeded in what you set out to do? You know, there's obviously a couple of things we look at. And I, I'm not gonna share exactly all of the metrics that we look at, but at a high level, there's two things that I'll say that, that, that come into consideration, right? One is, are users engaging with the information? Are, are they, you know, showing us that it's useful via how they interact with the product? Um, I'll also say that when we think about some of these interventions and we think about what makes sense in some especially these harder data void queries or these news topic queries, um, understanding and thinking about user research is very important to us, right? Because we think that user research gives us a lens that sometimes goes beyond metrics. And so there is an element of, of user study and user survey that we're looking at as well. Uh, hi, my name is Ashkan Kazami. I'm from University of Michigan. Uh, I was, I wanted to get your opinion about how you would go on uh, tackling misinformation in personalized search, because I would believe that some of these fake news websites uh, get a high ranking for some of pe uh, for some people's uh, search preferences. So, I think that's a question that I can't answer very well, and that is because. You know, there are certain searches that we don't do a lot of personalization on, and searches around news is, is very much one that, that we don't have a lot of personalization around. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think the um, paper with Dana Boyd that you quoted here actually highlights, I think, some really underlying problematic issues, um, such as that actually people want to see their biases and prejudices confirmed, right? And basically, if people are actually explicitly searching for that meme or searching for a particular source, there's, you know, I understand, you know, that you, you, there's really nothing you can do about it. And I mean, and similarly, when it comes to the, that the fact that even respectable news outlets that, that the previous speaker highlighted, you know, should be put to the front, and you're also saying that, but even they feel, you know, seem to be going in a direction where opinion is featured in the same way as actual facts or science are. I mean, um, sort of a bit provocatively in the face, is there anything we can do about these underlying trends? Because I think they're really making, you know, really going against and, and, and not helping even with the efforts that you're doing, you know, they continue to undermine them. I wonder if you had a view on that. 
Yes, definitely. <laughs> so, first, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, uh, there are definitely underlying problems that are indicated by the, the fact that people are looking for these sources. Um, I don't know that I would go back and say, though, there's nothing we can do, right? I think it's hard for us to do things that are respectful and, and don't get overly in the way of people needing and wanting access to information. Does that mean there's nothing? No. Um, but what exactly those things are is part of what I'm going to admit we're actively exploring and that I don't know all the answers to. Um, on your second thing about, you know, how are users and, and why are they coming to some of these things, um, I will say that we've seen a little bit of evidence of, of how people are coming through things as we've monitored and looked back at some of the searches, right? We have seen in some forums where uh, people are posing innocuous questions. Right? We've seen forums of people discussing news where uh, folks have gone in and said, you should ask if this is a false flag. And it's a very seemingly innocent question in those forums. But then when somebody comes and does a search and starts to research, was a terrorist attack a false flag, they, they fall into this data void. So we are seeing not only this, the, the navigational part is very much users have gotten a clear intent. There is that second aspect of those queries that users may not be just asking them in biased ways. It's more that they're being introduced somewhere to these alternative frames and alternative ways of thinking that they want to explore. And that very much can lead them down some very dangerous pathways very quick because you can start with a fairly innocuous question and go two, three steps down the line into and closer to some cases extremism. Uh, hi, my name is Andreas Vlachos. I think I was wondering what are your thoughts between what the users need and what the users want, because I think there is a balance that you okay. somehow have to find, right? Or, and you, I'm sure you're somehow adjusting that. I'm wondering what, what your, how you come, because for example, earlier with the perspectives is about maybe someone doesn't want to see that kale is not good for him. But yeah, so I think you understand my question. No, I, there definitely is a balance there. Right, and, and this is what I was getting to earlier, uh, I think a bit when I talked about the metrics, is sometimes it's not just about engagement and clicks. There is an aspect of user study. There, there's an aspect of looking at it more broadly in, in terms of how do we make sure users are getting all the information they need to understand things. But that's difficult, right? It's not necessarily easy to do. And it's not necessarily easy to understand exactly what interventions make sense to users. And I think one of the things that I find very interesting and very challenging, especially in the space, is thinking about what are those kind of interventions? What is that extra information that we can put in front of users that actually resonates, makes sense to them, and is respectful all at the same time? Stephanie Freitov, I'm here from the Harvard Global Health Institute. I'm a long-time journalist, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how much personalization you do when somebody searches, are vaccines safe? Yeah, so again, I'm going to talk really just from a Bing search perspective. There's little to no personalization on those queries. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I know it's a, it's a really tough question right now, but yeah. it is obviously a place in which lives are at stake, yeah. which sort of sharpens all these questions th yeah. that we're discussing a little bit. So if you could talk a little more about, you know, there's a recent Pinterest uh, decision to no longer mm -hmm. put anything other than very authorized medical sources um, up. So if you could expand a little bit on how you're trying to address this problem. Yeah, it's... It's a tough one, and it is one that is under active work right now to make sure that we're showing kind of the most credible and the most reputable. One of the things that we look at is 
when is a user asking a query, vers a question, versus explicitly asking for certain information, right? And when users are asking questions, when they're exploring, our goal is to give them the most credible, reputable information possible. Hi, I'm Angie from Newswise. Uh, we're a primary education project. We teach um, nine to 11 year olds about news literacy. So disinformation, bias, opinion, and so on. Um, I'm interested in your defending democracy program and wondered what role you think education has to play in the bigger picture and, and therefore what Microsoft's role should be in educating people. I think the education aspect is an interesting one, right? Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the broader stuff, and then if you want, I can introduce you to a colleague that's really focused on the defending democracy at the break. Uh, but I think it's important that we educate users on how they think about credibility, how they think about trust more broadly, right? What are the indicators they should be looking at? Um, understanding where things are coming into their systems as well. All right, so I think we had a great uh, debate this morning. Thanks a lot, Michael, for your... Yep. So it's time for lunch, and uh, we are back. We have one hour and a half. Um, the buffet is downstairs. Uh, please note that we'll, at the end of the conference, we'll also ask uh, a survey to know what was good, what was bad, so please uh, take some notes and give us some feedback at the end of the conference, so that the next one will be even better.